The United States, along with our allies and partners around the world, will continue to hold the Russian government accountable. Indeed, leaders from around the world are working together to further politically and financially isolate Russia, including by blocking Russia from international financial systems and economies. We took further measures against Russia's financial system in response to the Kremlin's flagrant violation of international law in utter disregard for the principles that underpin peace and security around the world. We have sanctioned Putin himself. We are disconnecting key Russian banks from SWIFT. We have imposed restrictive measures against Russia's central bank. And we are standing up a joint task force to find and freeze assets of sanctioned Russian companies, oligarchs, and other government officials. These actions will severely impact Putin's inner circle, impede the Kremlin's use of its international reserves, and limit its ability to fund ongoing destabilizing activities, including the Kremlin's war machine in Ukraine. President Putin and his cronies in Belarus will continue to face massive costs from the measures we have taken in complete coordination with our allies and partners. As the people of Ukraine continue to fight with courage and pride for their country, we will continue to provide them the assistance that they need. As you know, over the weekend, Secretary Blinken authorized a third assistance package of up to $350 million for immediate support to Ukraine's defenses, bringing the total security assistance over the past year to more than $1 billion in support of Ukraine's frontline defenders. We thank several allies and partners who have also joined us to expedite additional security assistance to Ukraine. We welcome more contributions from all allies and partners to give Ukrainians the support they need to defend themselves against Russian aggression and provide the assistance to the people of Ukraine. We are also heartened that Ukraine's neighbors continue to keep borders open to those seeking international protection, and we are urging all countries to allow unimpeded entry and access to all those fleeing violence. We are, we are engaging closely uh, with the UN agencies on the ground to ensure that every single person crossing into neighboring countries is received equally and with protection assistance their circumstances require. We are encouraging countries in the region to adhere to their refugee obligation and the principle of non refoulement In support of Ukraine's urgent humanitarian needs, we announced the additional provision, as I'm sure you saw, of nearly $54 million in humanitarian assistance to those affected by the Russian government's evasion, invasion. Uh, this additional assistance, uh, uh, jointly provided by the Department of State and the U.S. Agency for International Development, will enable international humanitarian organizations to further support the people of Ukraine. The United States stands in solidarity uh, with and will continue to support the government and, uh, and people of Ukraine in the face of Russia's unprovoked aggression. One final note. As you saw over the weekend, we have advised American citizens to consider departing Russia immediately on those commercial options that are still available. This morning, the Secretary announced that our embassy in Moscow has authorized the voluntary departure of employees and, non and family members. To be clear, this is not a retaliatory measure. We deem these measures necessary, necessary because of the safety and security issues resulting from Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine. Uh, one other element before we get to your questions. Uh, today, the United States joins the United Nations Human Rights Council at the Council's 49th regular session. The U.S. return to that body fulfills a pledge made by President Biden and reflects the centrality of human rights to our country's foreign policy. The timing of this session could not be more opportune. Since the, the opening moments of Russia's premeditated, unprovoked, and unjustified attack on Ukraine, reports of human rights abuses have been widespread. Let there be no confusion. Russia attacked Ukraine because Ukraine dared to pursue a democratic path. And just today, the Human Rights Council voted overwhelmingly in support of Ukraine's request to hold an urgent debate later this week, on Thursday, about human rights abuses in Ukraine. On March 1st, Secretary Blinken will deliver remarks uh, to, assembled, uh, to the assembled council members and will use that opportunity to spell out clearly the threat posed by Russia while noting that Ukraine is far from the only part of the world where the council's attention is needed on an urgent basis. 
U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva, Ambassador Sheba Crocker, uh, will head the U.S. delegation at this session, supported by recently confirmed ambassador uh, to the U.N. Human Rights Council, Michelle Taylor. Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, Ezra Zaya, uh, will also join the delegation in Geneva. With that, I'll turn to your questions. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I have a couple, but they'll all be brief, I promise. Um, and the first one is, just has to do with logistics. So when you say on the Human Rights Council, uh, did, did you, you guys were on the council to vote in favor of having this meeting on Ukraine? Or uh, was... Is that correct? That my that's my understanding. Okay. Correct. Well. Okay. All right. And but it's being called an urgent meeting, but it's been for four days, so I guess urgency is in the eye of the beholder here. Anyway, um, on the embassies, um, the French announced this morning that they were shutting up shop in Kiev and moving to Lviv, and I just wanted to check on you know, the status of the Lviv operations. Is it still the case that there's nobody there for the U.S., that, that they're all operating out of Poland? So as of last week, Matt, as you know, the small uh, team that um, uh, transferred to Lviv uh, had uh, transferred uh, to Poland uh, for the course of several days. They were making regular trips from Lviv into Ukraine. Uh, from the onset of uh, this phase of the Russian, in from, from Poland into Ukraine. Uh, from the uh, onset of this phase of uh, Russia's uh, unjustified, uh, premeditated, unprovoked assault uh, on Ukraine, uh, they have not uh, been uh, commuting back into Ukraine. Okay, so I, I guess this is for other countries, but do you know how many um, partner embassies, or, uh, par embassies of partners or allies remain open in Kyiv? I don't have those figures uh, available. Of course, we coordinate very closely uh, with our allies and partners. We have shared with them uh, the reasons for uh, our relocation of operations to Lviv, and subsequent to that, our relocation of operations uh, into Poland. I just don't have a tally to offer. Last one. Um, on the uh, diplomacy front, in terms of uh, what's going on, particularly in New York, um, are there any countries that you're, you are um, especially peeved with for how they have voted um, thus far or made made decisions to sponsor or not to co-sponsor co co or not to co-sponsor? Well, there's one that comes to mind. Uh, of course, the resolution in the Russia. UN Security Council uh, would have uh, been adopted uh, by the UN Security Council were, were it not for Russia's decision to use its veto. In fact, Russia was forced to use its veto. Uh, because countries either uh, voted in favor or abstained uh, on satisfied? that measure. Well, I wasn't talking about Russia. I mean, other than Russia, which was to be expected. But so, uh, do you? Um, you so you're happy with the way the rest of the world has come out and made their made their voices. We we are we are we are comfortable. We are heartened. We are gratified by the fact that uh, the world, the international community, has. Uh, stood up uh, to speak loudly and clearly uh, in defense of Ukraine's uh, sovereignty, its independence, its territorial integrity. Uh, the UN Security Council resolution you mentioned, Matt, uh, as you know, it would have been adopted were it not for the Russian veto. Uh, the, our team at the UN also worked with our close allies and partners uh, to garner uh, some 80 signatures within the UN General Assembly for uh, this very uh, resolution. So well beyond uh, the members of the UN Security Council, uh, permanent and rotating, that voted in favor of this, scores of countries around the world uh, signed on signed on to this in one way or another, and many more on top of that uh, have voiced uh, their clear, unambiguous opposition uh, to what the Russian Federation is doing, what the Red Russian Federation uh, has sought to do. Um, I'm just going to ask about nuclear stuff, but just one thing to follow up on that. Are you heartened and gratified by India abstaining? And UAE abstaining? Humaira, rather than focus on specific countries, uh, we well, have heard. Like US allies. Uh, of course, we have we have a very close relationship with uh, India. Uh, we've <laughs> we've discussed uh, our concerns, our shared concerns. Have you discussed uh, in the aftermath of the vote how you felt about? We have vote? we have regular engagement with our Indian partners. We have regular engagement with our Emirati partners. We have regular engagement uh, with our European allies and our European partners. So. Uh, at every level uh, in multiple fora, we have had discussions uh, about this. Okay. 
on the nuclear thing, so with the defense minister earlier today, they said they concluded that Russia is rather unlikely to use its nuclear weapons against the West. Does the United States share that assessment? Uh, look, I am not going to uh, prognosticate from here, but I do know uh, what the Russians uh, have said very clearly, uh, including in recent months. We have long agreed, the United States and the Russian Federation, uh, that nuclear use would have devastating, devastating consequences. Uh, we have stated that many times, including earlier this year in the aftermath of uh, the summit meeting that President Putin had uh, with President Biden in uh, Geneva. It was in the aftermath of that engagement that our two countries again came out with a joint statement reaffirming something we have said uh, since the Cold War, and that is that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Right. That is something that the Russian Federation has signed on to. It is something that we certainly believe, uh, and it is a principle uh, that we must uh, protect and preserve. Sure, but that was a while ago, and then they invaded. It was. And then they, they, so then do you think that they're still within that understanding? Are the indications that you're getting is similar to what the Swiss are getting, that they're not going to follow through this tile? Or well, uh, clearly this is provocative rhetoric. Uh, we uh, share the opinion with our partners and allies around the world uh, that this sort of provocative uh, rhetoric, more than being unnecessary, it is, it is dangerous. Uh, it adds to the risk of miscalculation. It, it should be uh, avoided. Uh, we are assessing President Putin's directive at this time. As I think you have uh, heard us say, we see no reason uh, to change our own uh, alert levels. Um, this gets back to the broader point. Throughout this crisis, while Russia was manufacturing it, and now that we are in the midst of this unjustified, premeditated, unprovoked invasion, uh, we have seen the Russian Federation, the Kremlin, President Putin himself, uh, consistently uh, try to turn the tables uh, by falsely alleging that it is Russia that is under threat, that Russia faced a threat from Ukraine. Uh, that Russia faced a threat from a defensive alliance, uh, that Russia was the one uh, that had no choice uh, but to wage a brutal, premeditated, unprovoked, uh, unjustified war against its neighbor. Um, neither we, nor NATO, nor Ukraine, uh, nor any other country has any desire or intention uh, for conflict with Russia. Uh, at the same time, we are unwavering in our commitment uh, to extended deterrence and confident in our ability to defend ourselves uh, and our allies. As, you, as you've heard us say, our commitment to Article 5 is just as strong today as it was uh, at NATO's founding more than 70 years ago. Sir. Thank you. Um, I'm Mark Stone from Sky News. Uh, thanks, Ned. Um, first of all, can you give us any sense of what your reading is of what President Putin meant yesterday? Is he talking about uh, battlefield nuclear weapons, or was he talking about something even more frightening? That's my first question. Look, I don't think it is uh, wise or responsible for me to try to interpret, to try to read into uh, what P President Putin uh, might have been signaling, trying to signal. Uh, again, we think that this type of rhetoric uh, is provocative, it is profoundly unhelpful, uh, and it is at its core dangerous. Uh, we think it, it should be avoided. And, and so, so to follow up, uh, what is your assessment of his state of mind and how are you a accessing uh, that assessment? I mean, are, are conversations like that with Naf Naftali Bennett of Israel yesterday and Emmanuel Macron, are they helpful? Uh, uh, what's the, what are the lines of communications to work out what's going on in his head? Well, uh, we are going to judge the Russian Federation. We are going to judge President Putin by his actions. Uh, and clearly his actions uh, in recent days uh, have uh, justified uh, and given us cause uh, to justify precisely what we said we would do uh, in, um, uh, in the, in the run-up to this unprovoked uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, President Putin, his cronies, the Kremlin, uh, those around them, uh, they are facing uh, the unprecedented set of economic and financial measures, uh, just as we promised, not based uh, on rhetoric, uh, not based on uh, threats alone, but uh, based on uh, their actions. When it comes to our engagement, um, look, here clearly 
uh, our relationship uh, with uh, Russia and the world's relationship with Russia uh, is different today than uh, it was last week uh, or than it was uh, before this uh, unprovoked crisis began uh, late last year. Uh, but uh, we still believe in diplomacy. We know that diplomacy is the only responsible, sustainable uh, means by which to end this conflict. Uh, it is precisely why we are supporting our Ukrainian partners as they engage in those talks. Other countries around the world have continued to engage with the Russian Federation. If we need to engage with the Russian Federation, we have the ability to do so ourselves, whether it is through the State Department, whether it is through uh, the Defense Department, whether it is through uh, any other uh, channel we have uh, with the Russian Federation. So the, the deconfliction lines uh, are open in terms of with defense or with state, that they're there? Uh, we have maintained deconfliction channels with the Russian Federation for the better part of a decade now. Again, we think that uh, the ability to communicate clearly uh, is in some ways even more important during times of crisis and conflict as we are in now uh, than, it would otherwise, than it otherwise would be. Yes, Kylie. Um, just to put one more question to you on the nuclear deterrent aspect of this. Um, what has happened to Russia's nuclear arsenal since Putin said over the weekend that they would be putting their nuclear deterrent forces on alert? Again, we are not in a position to characterize uh, anything the Russians might have done. Um, you'll have to ask them uh, if uh, President Putin's rhetoric was matched by any sort of action. We have had no change uh, in our posture uh, at this time. We don't judge there is any need for a change. Okay, and then um, after the talks today between the Ukrainians and the Russians, um, they announced that they'd have another round in a few days. Um, just do you have a response to that? and? Do you think um, that the continuation of talks is any reflection of how Russia feels about its military advances in Ukraine? Well, as I said before, we support Ukraine in its efforts to find a diplomatic resolution to this conflict. Ukraine sought before the onset of this invasion, invasion to do just that. The United States sought before the onset of this invasion to do just that. Uh, our allies in Europe sought before this invasion to do just that. The OSCE sought to do just that. The NATO-Russia Council sought to do just that. At every turn, the Russian Federation uh, rejected uh, those offers of substantive, constructive engagement. Uh, now that the invasion, we are in the midst of an invasion, we have heard this very message from President Zelensky, from Foreign Minister Kuleba, uh, we, we, you would be uh, right to color us skeptical uh, of what it is that Moscow intends. What we've said before, including last week, applies equally today. Diplomacy at the barrel of a gun, diplomacy at the turret of a tank, that is not real diplomacy. Uh, we are ready and willing, just as our Ukrainian partners are, just as our European allies are to engage in real, in substantive, in genuine diplomacy in order to see if we can find a way out of what is a needless, brutal conflict. But that diplomacy is highly unlikely to bear fruit, to prove effective in the midst of not only um, uh, confrontation, but escalation. Uh, well before the invasion started, we made the point that we were all for diplomacy, uh, but in order for it to bear fruit, it needed to take place in the context of de-escalation. That is in some ways even more true now. Um, we are supportive of Ukrainians uh, engaging uh, with Russian counterparts. We are offering, um, as you know, Foreign Minister Kuleba had an opportunity yesterday to uh, convene with uh, the G7 ministers. President Biden has had an opportunity in recent days to speak to uh, excuse me, President Zelensky has an opportunity in recent days to speak to President Biden. Secretary Blinken has had several conversations with Foreign Minister Kuleba uh, on a bilateral basis in any, uh, in any number of days. So we are comparing notes, we are uh, coordinating uh, closely, uh, and we are supportive, knowing what we all assume are the limitations on diplomacy in the present context. It is uh, precisely what uh, Foreign Minister Kaleba and President Zelensky uh, have spoken to. We share uh, a sense of skepticism, uh, but at the same time, we want to exhaust every 
potentially viable diplomatic avenue. Uh, yes? And along that with the negotiations between the Russian and Ukrainian uh, delegations this morning, have you, has this department had a, a sort of idea or reading or talking to the Ukrainians about how that went, if they're optimistic or not? Are you optimistic that there really will be more talks in the coming days? And obviously that's subject to what happens in the next few days. I, I'm sure we will have a readout from our Ukrainian partners in short order. As you know, the talks uh, only recently concluded for the day before I came out here. Um, we had high-level engagement with our Ukrainian partners over the weekend, late last week. Uh, our uh, shared approach, uh, in some ways our shared skepticism, is something we've discussed uh, in private. It is also something that our Ukrainian partners have discussed publicly, uh, just as we have. So I am sure uh, in the coming hours uh, we will uh, be hearing with and speaking with our Ukrainian partners. Uh, as for the next steps, uh, we are supportive of uh, what our Ukrainian partners deem to be uh, in their uh, best interest. They will find a partner uh, in the United States uh, going forward in this in this effort. Yeah, Will. Uh, I just want to follow up on the location of the talks at, you know, along the Belarusian border and, and what your assessment is of, of, of Belarus, uh, Belarus's participation in the peace talks or potentially in the conflict? Well, uh, what I will say generally about uh, Belarus um, is that they and President Lukashenko have allowed President Putin to make a mockery of Belarus, Belarus's independence, of uh, its purported sovereignty. Uh, that has been the case for some time now, as Russian forces have flooded in uh, to Belarus, as Russian forces have staged uh, inside what should be sovereign uh, Belarusian territory to undertake a premeditated, unjustified, unprovoked uh, attack and invasion uh, against a, a third country. Uh, the, all the while, the regime continues to brutally repress the democratic aspirations uh, of the people of, of Belarus. It has, as I said before, become increasingly subservient uh, to Russia, uh, demonstrating again uh, President Lukashenko's willingness uh, to act against the interests of his own people in order to curry favor with Moscow and, and to stay in power. Uh, as a result of the regime's indefensi indefensible support for and even facilitation uh, of what we are seeing the Russians do uh, in Ukraine, we're imposing sanctions. We have imposed sanctions on some two dozen Belarusian uh, individuals and entities. Um, these actions focus on Belarus's defense and related material and, and finance sectors, uh, two fields that are uh, closely tied to Russia. And do you think the, do you think they'll escalate their participation in the conflict? You, you say they're already facilitating it. Well, uh, again, you uh, it is not for me to try and predict uh, what Belarus uh, might do, might seek to do, or more importantly, uh, what Moscow might impose uh, on. Uh, Belarus to do. Uh, we have seen at every turn that uh, President uh, Lukashenko uh, has set aside, cast aside uh, the will of his own people and cast his lot with President Putin and his uh, militaristic aims uh, against Ukraine. Uh, so if that continues, uh, Belarus will continue to face uh, measures of uh, profound accountability. Uh, I, Paul, yeah. Um, what communications has the U.S. government had with Russia, say, over the past 48 hours, or even since the secretary uh, canceled the talks with Lavrov? Uh, on, on the Treasury side, on the defense side, uh, the, the state side? So I wouldn't want to characterize uh, every element uh, of engagement, but again, uh, we believe that in times of crisis, uh, we believe that lines of communication are in some ways even more important. So we have uh, continued to engage the Russian Federation. Uh, there are issues that are of bilateral interest to us. Our staffing posture uh, in Moscow uh, is one such, such issue. Uh, delivering uh, notices to marshes uh, is something we continue to have the ability to do. Uh, it is something we're able to do uh, out of our embassy in uh, Moscow. I am not aware uh, of any high-level engagement uh, since the secretary informed Secretary uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, last week that we did not deem uh, this 
context to be appropriate or conducive uh, for diplomacy, for the meeting that was to have taken place in Geneva uh, last Thursday. But again, if we need to convey uh, a high-level message to the Russian Federation or a lower-level mes message to the Russian Federation, uh, we have the ability to do that. Was that done over, uh, after President Putin's statement on his nuclear posture? Has there been engagement in the yeah. past 24 hours? Uh -huh. I, I couldn't speak to whether there has been uh, direct contact within the past 24 hours, but there has been recent engagement uh, on areas that are of uh, uh, in our national interest, and that includes uh, issues of our bilateral uh, of our staffing presence in Moscow. Okay, one follow up: uh, the, the, the Ukrainians have been asking for months and months for. Uh, even more, even better weaponry than the U.S. has been supplying them, and especially for Stinger rockets, which can take down aircraft. Um, is the U.S. supplying Stinger uh, missiles to Ukraine? So, Paul, we have, over uh, the past year, committed uh, more than $1 billion in security assistance to Ukraine. That includes the $350 million that Secretary Blinken uh, signed out uh, over the weekend. It includes the $200 million that uh, President Biden authorized and was signed out in December. It includes the $60 million that uh, was signed out uh, and um, committed uh, with the visit of President Zelensky uh, last year. Uh, we're, I'm not in a position to detail every element of that security assistance, but what I can say is that in, it includes uh, supplies that are um, effective when it comes to anti-armor, uh, anti-aircraft, small arms, munitions. Uh, this is a discussion we have had uh, at many levels um, for, uh, on a consistent basis with our Ukrainian partners to determine precisely uh, what their security, their defensive security needs are. Uh, the provision of our defensive security assistance is calibrated precisely uh, to those needs. I should add that the $200 million that was authorized by President Biden in December, uh, that we have not yet um, uh, spent uh, all that money, and so uh, there was never a pause in the delivery of our security assistance. We, uh, Secretary Blinken, authorized this additional $350 million, knowing and consistent with President, what President Biden said prior to the Russian invasion, that if Russia were to invade Ukraine, not only would our security assistance continue, uh, but we would double down on it. We have made good on that pledge as well. What is all this with Reagan? Um, yeah. Russia's UN envoy says 12 Russian UN diplomats ordered by United States to leave by March 7th. Can you confirm and talk about it? Uh, I don't have anything uh, to offer there. Obviously, I'm, I haven't seen these, these headlines. Were you not aware of this time? Uh, I, again, I haven't seen a headline that just came out uh, before I took the podium. Um, just one, one more. Uh, again, I, I, can't, I can't speak to something I, I haven't seen the full okay. details of. But also one more thing on the recent engagement. You just said there wasn't any high-level one, but Russia's foreign minister today said Russia complained to the U.S. ambassador to Moscow over what it described as hostile protests near its diplomatic facilities. And from their readout, I understand that um, John Sullivan was in a meeting uh, with, uh, you know, with the Russians in Moscow, and it says they also discussed other bilateral issues. Can you talk a little bit about what was discussed, and did you guys get any indication from this meeting that Russians may want to talk about any diplomatic path or anything like that? So I indicated before that our embassy in Moscow continues to have the ability to engage with our Russian counterparts on issues that are of uh, interest to, to us. Uh, Ambassador Sullivan uh, has continued to engage at his level. Uh, we have not uh, had high-level engagements from Secretary Blinken, Deputy Secretary Sherman, uh, from the department here. But of course, uh, even with the announcement of today's authorized departure of uh, non-emergency employees and eligible family members, we still have Americans on the ground in Moscow, their safety, their security is of paramount importance to us. Uh, the ambassador uh, often does engage with his Russian counterparts on issues pertaining, uh, pertaining to that and uh, will continue to. Yes. Uh, just to be absolutely clear, the, the Russians in New York are saying that you have expelled or asked 12 UN diplomats, Russian diplomats, to leave the United States. Are you saying you don't you, you can't comment on that? You don't know about it? I, I don't have those details in front of me. This apparently just came out uh, during yeah, since the time you, I've been up here. But 
but can you react to it? Is it, is it accurate? Have you uh, asked 12 I'm, options? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to react to something that uh, has, has just come out while I'm, uh, as I've been up here. <laughs> ongoing, that is not r related to Ukraine, that this is part of the ongoing spat over diplomatic spat, uh, over diplomatic staffing, in which you have said that you have told Russians who are here, who have been here, diplomats in the U.S. who have been here longer than three years. We have been they, clear about the three-year visa validity. We have, what we've also been clear about is that uh, the watchword for us is parity. We want to see diplomatic parity uh, between our mission in Moscow. Uh, and what the right. Russians maintain here. So, so my question, I'm not just saying that to say it. Uh, my question is, does that parity include Russia? Uh, obviously, the Russians have more people here because they have a mission, because you are the host of the UN, mm -hmm. and they, ha they have a mission up there, whereas, you know, you, you have a mission in New York, too, but they're Americans. So are the... Are the diplomats who are, the Russian diplomats who are posted to New York considered part of, uh, when you talk about parity, are they considered part of that? When we talk about our bilateral missions, typically we refer to uh, our embassy in Moscow, uh, yeah, our, embassy in Washington. and their, and their not embassy in New York, and not the mission in Typically New York. when we talk about it, we talk about our okay. respective so, bilateral missions. So that would then suggest that this is something different than the parity uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure we'll have more to say on this later today. Anything else? Yes. Uh, you, uh, you and other officials have remarked lately how bizarre the Russian president's speeches have been, and you know his, uh, and and now he's we see him issuing nuclear threats. And so I wonder, do you still consider him um, a rational actor? Um, and uh, on sanctions. Um, that were announced today. Do you have any parameters for um, when you can climb down from those? So I don't think it's uh, useful, productive, or even possible for me to try to get into President Putin's head. Uh, it's certainly not something I would want to do. Uh, from here, again, what matters to us are the actions uh, of uh, the Russian Federation. And again, if uh, rhetoric materializes into action that threatens uh, our, directly threatens our allies or the United States, as you've heard from the President. We will respond resolutely. We will respond decisively. Our commitment to Article 5 uh, is sacrosanct. Our commitment to uh, our allies uh, is unwavering, uh, and that will remain the case. Um, when it comes to the, the sanctions, your question was, how do we, how do we climb down from this? Yeah. Well, uh, first, uh, our goal has been uh, to climb up uh, because of what the Russian Federation uh, has done. We were clear that if Russia were to pursue this path, uh, the costs would be uh, profound. And I think you have seen that. Everyone is familiar, or everyone, uh, I assume uh, just about everyone is familiar with the steps that we've taken uh, as recently as this morning, as recently as the weekend, on Friday, so I won't go through that entire litany. What might be more productive is to speak to the implications of some of those measures. And we have seen uh, the Russian economy and the Russian uh, financial system uh, react as we might have expected uh, to the severity and scale of these measures. Uh, the ruble has fallen uh, about 20%, uh, and it's trading at its weakest level ever. The Russian stock market uh, was kept closed today. I understand it will be kept closed, uh, closed tomorrow, uh, likely due to fear of capital flight. Uh, if it were to open, uh, that is a very precarious situation to be in, having to keep your stock market closed uh, for fear of what would otherwise uh, transpire. Uh, the Central Bank of Russia uh, more than doubled their key interest rate to 20%. A 20% interest rate uh, is not something that uh, a country can sustain. Uh, this is the highest level in almost 20 years, uh, and the central bank also institute, instituted uh, capital controls by ordering domestic brokers uh, to reject foreign bids to sell Russian currency, Russian securities. Uh, Russian authorities are also forcing exporters uh, to sell at least 80% of their foreign currency uh, that they receive in order to prop up the rapidly uh, weakening currency. Uh, the S&P late last week on Friday uh, downgraded Russia's uh, credit rating to junk 
status uh, with the measures that we've announced against the Russian Central Bank, this slush fund, uh, supposedly sanction-proofing um, depository for uh, President Putin, amassing hundreds of billions of dollars uh, over the years in an effort to evade Western sanctions, uh, we have essentially cut off uh, his ability uh, to weather uh, the, uh, the sanction storm uh, that together we have imposed with our partners and allies. But your question was uh, really in the other direction. And what would it take to climb down from here? And I would make a couple points. One, sanctions are not an end in and of themselves. Uh, sanctions are a means to an end. Uh, and, the mean, and the end we are seeking to achieve in this case uh, is an end to this conflict, an end to this brutal war, an end to the loss of life uh, that Russia is inflicting needlessly on an unprovoked basis uh, to its neighbor. Uh, so we want to see de-escalation. Uh, we believe, uh, as we do in, in this case, as we do in other cases, uh, that these economic measures uh, will apply pressure on the Russian Federation uh, to ultimately uh, do the right thing, and that is to bring an end to this conflict. Were that to happen, uh, these measures uh, would be calibrated accordingly. If that does not happen, if Russia continues to escalate, these measures will be calibrated accordingly. Uh, we are prepared to escalate further. Uh, we are also prepared to calibrate in the other direction uh, if these measures have their intended effect. But the conflict can end, you know, on different terms. So, uh, like, do you, is, is that a simple, um, the conflict ends, the sanctions end? end? Because, you know, they're, you know what their um, end, Russians, end goal is. Uh, I mean, they, they want to end this conflict, but on their terms, right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be quite so categorical. Obviously, there will need to be accountability uh, for what uh, the Russian Federation has done. Uh, the fact that it has launched uh, this needless, unprovoked, unjustified uh, war against its neighbor, um, that is something that uh, the United States, together with the international community, uh, we, will need to, uh, we will need to wrestle with how best to hold uh, the Russian Federation accountable for that, just as we have continued to hold the Russian Federation accountable for its attempted annexation of Crimea, uh, for its uh, incursion and invasion into the Donbass uh, in 2014, some, some eight years ago. Um, what we have seen, and I'll, I'll make this point, uh, is that this conflict has already displaced hundreds of thousands of individuals, of people, and resulted in significant civilian casualties. Uh, this is a war that threatens to um, explode even further on urban areas, uh, rendering even more displacement, uh, casualties, loss of uh, civilian life. Um, and civilians, we know, will bear the brunt, especially as this conflict encroaches uh, on uh, civilian population centers and civilian cities. Uh, we consider reports of civilian casualties uh, to be credible uh, and in line with Russia's past operations, uh, both in uh, Russia-controlled areas of Ukraine and in conflict areas elsewhere in the world where Russia has been uh, belligerent. Uh, the government of Russia and all Russian personnel involved in these operations should know that the United States is supporting an international multilateral effort uh, to um, detect and document uh, potential human rights abuses uh, or violations of international humanitarian law. Uh, and as I was saying before, we are equally committed to supporting the pursuit of ac accountability for human rights violations, for abuses of international humanitarian law, for potential war crimes, uh, for other uh, potential atrocities, using every tool available, including criminal prosecutions where appropriate. Uh, leverage to, to do anything about the humanitarian situation uh, or to you know stop this kind of thing. You, we've talked about making comments in the Human Rights Council and the uh, General Assembly or or um, the Security Council where Russia has a veto. Uh, if Russia is, is willing to escalate this conflict further, uh, do, you, do you agree with that, first of all? And second yeah. of all, what is, what is the real leverage if Russia can veto these measures and can you know uh, simply pr proceed? Well, I'll make a couple points there. One, uh, Russia cannot veto 
uh, our efforts, international efforts, multilateral efforts uh, to document and to hold accountable uh, those responsible for violations of human rights and international humanitarian law. Uh, this could be at the political level, uh, it could be at the operational level. Uh, and together with our partners, uh, we will assemble uh, everything we can to hold these individuals to account, uh, whether that form is criminal uh, or uh, in any other uh, context. Um, what I will also say on the humanitarian front is that the United States uh, continues to be uh, the single largest provider of humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. Uh, this was one of the many measures uh, that you heard uh, from us uh, in recent hours. It was yesterday uh, that we announced $54 million in additional humanitarian assistance uh, to Ukraine to help uh, the people of Ukraine. That is in addition uh, to $52 million uh, that we have provided to Ukrainians in Ukraine uh, over uh, the past year. Uh, and as the humanitarian needs of our Ukrainian partners increase, uh, we will be prepared uh, to work with the international community to do more. We're working closely with the UN, we're working closely with uh, NGOs and aid organizations on the ground. Uh, as you know, our humanitarian assistance uh, goes to our partners who are on the ground, and we've been in uh, regular contact with our humanitarian uh, partner providers. Uh, many of them are still able to uh, conduct their important, their life-saving work uh, inside of Ukraine, and we're continuing uh, to fund them, as are so many of our uh, allies and partners uh, around the world. Uh, so Moscow can be obstructionist uh, in some ways. Moscow uh, can politically uh, stand in the way, but Moscow would have a hard time standing in the way of this work, and Moscow won't be able to stand, stand in the way uh, of the accountability to which we're committed. What specific things are you worried about? There have been reports of cluster munitions, but I guess neither Russia nor U.S. or or full signatories to that. Um, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield has mentioned possible atrocities. What, what specific things are you looking at or worried about? What re reports concern you the most? Uh, we are concerned about the whole and the entire gamut. Uh, we have seen reports that uh, civilians have been killed. Uh, we have seen reports that children have been killed. I'm sure uh, all of us have seen the images of uh, kindergarten uh, that was destroyed, uh, tales that have emanated from uh, Ukraine uh, of uh, innocent civilians who have been uh, maimed, injured, uh, or even killed uh, in the conduct of uh, this senseless war. We've seen uh, residential buildings with giant pockmarks in them, smoke billowing uh, from uh, civilian population centers. All of this is cause for uh, profound concern, uh, even if and when civilian infrastructure and uh, civilian locations aren't intentionally targeted, uh, as we know, uh, there is no weapon in the world uh, that can be as precise as any belligerent uh, would like. And so when uh, another country seeks to take civilian population centers in circles, a city of 2.9 million people like Kyiv uh, apparently has an interest uh, in forcibly taking Kyiv, uh, that has the potential uh, to uh, result in significant uh, civilian harm and civilian loss of life. Uh, that's something we're going to be watching very closely. Paul. Um, on uh, sanctions and, and oligarchs, uh, Britain has uh, just expanded its list of people they're sanctioning, including uh, the tycoon Usmanov. Uh, is the U.S. going to expand its sanctions of oligarchs, or did what we had uh, today, is that the last of U.S. sanctions? We will do more, uh, assuming uh, the Russian Federation continues uh, to escalate. And we have seen no indication uh, at this point that uh, the Russian Federation is prepared to uh, do otherwise. You're right that the oligarchs and cronies that uh, we've sanctioned, uh, they are, the lists are symmetrical, uh, but they are not identical, uh, just as we have done with our allies and partner, partners with our other economic and financial means. Uh, we will increasingly bring those two things uh, closer together. They may not, um, they may not be uh, identical uh, at the end of the day, just given different uh, authorities um, and our, our different systems, but they will uh, ultimately be symmetrical and, and mutually reinforcing. And yes, uh, we will do more. Um, beyond additional targets, what we are launching and what you heard about recently uh, is the task force that uh, together with uh, our allies and partners, uh, we are going to identify, we are going to hunt down 
uh, and freeze the assets of Russian companies and oligarchs. We are going to hunt down their yachts. We are going to hunt down uh, their mansions, uh, any other ill-gotten gains uh, that we can find and freeze under the law. Uh, no longer will they have be able to operate with impunity uh, in the West. No longer will they be able to invest their ill-gotten gains uh, in um, uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, the, their ability to send their uh, children to uh, boarding schools uh, around the world these are all things uh, that we are going to go after uh, very uh, aggressively together with our allies and partners. Two follow-ups. One is uh, one of the most powerful uh, oligarchs is uh, Roman Abram Abramowicz, who is an uh, Israeli citizen, uh, yet he seems to have a, a sweeping influence in Russia. Uh, why hasn't he been targeted? Again, our sanctions, uh, they are statutory, uh, and every target has to meet uh, the statutory definition, statutory requirements. Uh, so I wouldn't want to uh, rule any entity um, or person in or out, uh, but as appropriate, we will continue to go after additional oligarchs and cronies. Okay, and the final one is, do any of these oligarchs, uh, billionaires, have actually have currently significant assets in the United States? I think we have uh, all uh, heard uh, and, and know there are certain jurisdictions, including in this country, uh, where uh, Russian oligarchs have attempted to hide uh, their uh, ill-gotten gains. Uh, we will, working with our allies and partners, do everything we can uh, to identify those, uh, to root them out, uh, and to make to close uh, those uh, to close their ability uh, to hide those gains. Well, will, we, will we know if anything is seized or blocked in a, a home, a yacht in the United States? It, any of that would take place in a law enforcement context, I would presume, so I would need to refer to uh, my law enforcement counterparts. Yeah, I'm a little confused about the context. Presumably, you guys already know. We, this, right? the I mean, I'll, I'll give you yachts and aircraft. They can move and might go out of U.S. jurisdictions. But if some guy's got a massive mansion in Palm Beach, it's not like he can, you, you know about it already, right? No? Uh, this is an effort to share information with, to work with, to coordinate with uh, our allies and partners. You're right. Some of this is about uh, assets that can move between jurisdictions, uh, but clearly there is um, uh, a determination on the part of the United States and the part of our allies and partners, including uh, some partners who uh, previously have sought to uh, maintain some degree of neutrality. The fact is that no responsible country around the world can be neutral when it comes to Russia's unprovoked, unjustified, needless uh, invasion of Ukraine. And we've seen any number of countries uh, demonstrate very clearly, very vividly, uh, that they are standing on the side of Ukraine, they're standing on the side of the rules-based international so order. to say that the U.S. contribution to this task force, since you most likely already have identified assets, immovable assets, like property and maybe money, and um, that you, mainly what you're going to be doing with this task force is assisting other countries to in, in finding um, these properties or whatever in, in, in their jurisdictions? Well, clearly uh, anything that's in the United States would be under the purview of domestic authorities here, and right. uh, it would be under the purview of law enforcement to uh, take any appropriate uh, action. But yes, we have uh, intelligence, we have information, uh, we have an ability uh, to identify and to pinpoint uh, some of these assets that other countries might not. I have two non-Ukrainians. Okay, two, very, I didn't hear you say very quick, but I'll assume very quick non-Ukrainians. Great. <laughs> Does anyone else want to go, though? I don't want to. It's all you. Okay, um, one, today is the day. Today is the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the Shanghai Communique. <laughs> Did you guys make a conscious decision to snub the Chinese or to, to, to just let this one go by? Matt, there are many anniversaries that go by know, uh, without, a a one. without a statement from the State Department. It doesn't in any, any way mean that we are trying to diminish uh, the historical meaning or importance of an anniversary. I know you look forward to our statements on every occasion, but uh, sometimes... Uh, well, okay, but it just seems... have a statement on every occasion. <laughs> you I, do. I mean, you know, the National Bay of Narnia, you guys put out a statement on, you know. It's, but, but, but this is a pretty big deal, you know, or at least it was 50 years ago. So I just want to make sure that you're intentionally not recognizing the anniversary. 
Uh, I am not aware of us having any plans to issue a statement, Second. but I wouldn't read more into it than right. that. Okay. Second one. Um, you had the um, the secretary was at, and then presumably he left to go do other things. But uh, the Bahrain um, strategic dialogue happened this mm -hmm. morning, um, or whenever it was this afternoon. Uh, I, I just want to ask about um, political prisoners in, in Bahrain and if that issue was raised, in particular the case that I've raised before about Professor Alsengate. Uh, I know that we've engaged uh, Bahraini authorities on that specific case previously. I couldn't say whether it was raised today. I wasn't in that meeting. Uh, but if we have anything to share, we will. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Can you say where we are in the Iran talks? Uh, where we are in Iran talks, uh, clearly, and you heard me say this last week, uh, there uh, has been significant progress uh, in recent days uh, that um, uh, I think it is fair to say, and you've heard this from our allies and partners, uh, that we are at a decisive moment. And I think you all saw the reports that the Iranian negotiator uh, went back to Tehran, uh, only recently uh, returned to Vienna. Uh, so I would expect uh, we will have uh, additional clarity uh, in the coming days. Uh, and we will need to have additional clarity in the coming days, uh, given that we are uh, at this decisive, consequential moment, uh, knowing that Tehran's nuclear advancements uh, will soon render uh, the nonproliferation benefits that the JCPOA conveyed uh, essentially uh, meaningless before too long. So just, just one thing on that, since you were last to Iran. Um, he also said, Iran also said there are three main unresolved issues, and they're still really important. So. You're saying uh, this week is critical. You guys have said that for a while now, but are you prepared to walk away if those issues are not resolved by the end of the week? Uh, we are prepared to walk away if Iran, if Iran displays an int intransigence to making progress. Uh, but let me be clear that walking away won't mean leaving the status quo. Uh, we have talked about the alternatives, at least in general terms, the alternatives uh, that we have developed and we are prepared uh, to pursue uh, together with our allies and partners uh, if the Iranians uh, are unwilling to engage uh, in good faith in a constructive way on the remaining outstanding issues. Thank you all very much.